good morning or indeed good afternoon, depending on what time you're actually viewing this video. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dominic Brown. I am one of the LaPada um, approved service providers. I'm a freelance photographer and I specialise in photographing uh, fine and decorative arts. I'm based in Froome and I have been to a large room in Somerset for the last uh, nine years. Previous to that, I was working for the Royal Collection for almost 20 years, again, photographing all the objects within the Royal Collection. So I have a range of experience, almost 30 years of experience, photographing anything from ceramics through to paintings, through to furniture, uh, arms and armour. So pretty much the full gambit. Now, the reason I'm speaking to you is because about a week ago I was contacted by the good people at Lepada and they have asked me to put together for you a few guidelines um, in order to take your own photographs. Obviously people like myself uh, and um, other photographers, professional photographers are affected by lockdown. You yourselves will be affected by lockdown so we can't get out to take your photographs you are going to be taking your photographs at the moment or attempting to take your photographs. Now I'm aiming to get you or give you some ideas as to things to avoid and things you can do just to sort of improve, bring up your, the standard photograph. Um, so it's okay, so it will be a decent photograph. Um, now, with bearing this in mind, I'm not gonna to go too technical. I'm not going to go down the sort of technical route. But what I will assume is that you all either have a digital camera, uh, um, some basic knowledge of how to use it. Failing that, I'm going to aim at the sort of lower level that you will be using one of the um, smartphones, camera on the smartphone. So where do we get started on this? I assume you've all got cameras uh, and you're okay with them and how to use them. Um, one of the first things that I'm asked when I work, work out, out away from home um, and for clients is how much space do I need? Very simple answer to that is as much space as you can afford. So if you're going to be doing a whole load of uh, pieces of furniture, obviously, you know, take into account the space that you need. It's so important to have a good working space. I've set up here just a very small tabletop space. You can see that. We'll have a look at that a little bit later. The reason for having so much space is the most important thing is uh, the safety of the object you are photographing. These pieces of, uh, pieces of furniture or ceramics have been uh, around for quite some time and you do not want to be responsible for breaking them. So consider the space you're working in. Is it safe? Is it avoiding um, other bits of furniture? You know, have you got clear space around? Also, bearing that in mind, do you have distance away from the object to enable a decent photograph? So if you're going to be setting a tripod up over here somewhere, is there enough space? We need to have space around the object so if you have space here and here then you can put in various reflectors lights if you have them and we'll come to that later just clear space around obviously the more space the better now a lot of people also forget um, the transportation of the objects to the set this is a key element of your workflow through the day organize yourselves so that you can make efficient use of the, of the time that you're, you're, you've allotted to taking photographs. Before you move any objects to the set, if it's obviously not too difficult for a small piece like this, but if you're moving bits of furniture, consider the route you have to take and any objects in the way. Making this extra time just is so, so useful, just to clear the space, efficient workflow and then you'll get on good and proper. Um, also, after you've considered the space and where you're photographing, have you got space to remove the object and place away from the whole 
could set up your workspace for that day. You know, you may be photographing three, four, five, six pieces, even more. Have you got somewhere to store it after photographing? Now, I have to apologise because I'm going to be working a little bit from notes so that my uh, memory doesn't drift off. So that's your workspace. Also, be aware that there will be trip hazards, things above you, things to the side, could fall on the object, you just don't want it. I'm not going to teach you to suck eggs, any of you, but also please consider how you carry the objects. Don't pick things up by handles, don't pick things up by the arm, uh, arm, the arm rests, obviously underneath and above, two hands the whole time. And what was the quote that when I was told when I was doing the course? Love your load, bring it into you, make sure you're okay as well, make sure you don't put your back out doing this sort of object, moving. Obviously when you're moving it, just be very aware of what you're walking by. Look up, look to the sides, look behind, everywhere. Always look up, because that is a key one. So many times I've seen close misses with people just lifting things up and not assuming and not not realising that there's a chandelier or a thing hanging from the ceiling. Just be careful. You don't want to break these objects. You essentially are going to be selling them on and moving them on. Okay, so that's your workspace, essentially. That's how we're going to work on that one. Once you've got your workspace and you're happy with it, comfortable, then we have to consider what you're going to photograph the object on. Right, so, the background. For your objects, what you want to achieve, or what I'm hoping you're wanting to achieve, is a good, clean, clear object, free of clutter. So, as you can see, for something like this, I've done a very simple um, setup. I've taken away this so you can actually see what I've got down here. I've got a board on top of the table, a little bit of black, uh, grey background paper. When considering your background paper, please consider using neutral colours. Whites, light greys, slightly darker greys. If you're photographing glass and objects like that, you will have to go on a darker colour, something like a black or a dark grey. It just exaggerates and accentuates the qualities of the glass itself. But for something like this, good pale grey backgrounds. If you start using strange sort of blues and yellows and greens, uh, the problem is with that you will get some sort of extraordinary colour cast off reflective surfaces. It doesn't look good, it looks very strange. Also, on those colours, it just looks, it dates it. Years ago there used to be a sort of propensity to photograph objects on sort of yellows and blues and greens back in the 1980s, and you can date them. Um, so just be aware of that. If you have greys and whites, um, it just means that it's not, there's no distraction from the object itself, okay? So, if you don't have one of these, four foot roll of paper, use any paper you can find. You can, you can certainly buy these, they're, on, they're perfectly readily available from various photographic supplies, or even online, online you can buy those. Um, so you can use those, um, if not, use white card, pieces like so, you can make a fairly decent sort of tabletop background. It just means that you get clear air around the object, so set up a little scoop like that, that gives an almost sort of infinity feel to it. Um, and then you can get to work on it. Smaller objects are absolutely fine on something like this. I can do a decent photograph on that. Um, obviously, if you're going to be using or wanting to photo, if you're obviously wanting to photograph pieces of furniture, a whole different ball game comes into play. So what you have to think about is whether or not you can afford or you can have the space for a nine-foot background paper. Obviously, drop that into a decent space. Move the objects on top of that. Now, if a lot of you don't have the facilities to uh, use a nine foot roll of paper, then, then consider again the space you're going to photograph. Plain backgrounds, plain floors, plain walls. 
you know, uh, what you're wanting to do is not photograph what's around the object, you want to photograph the object itself um, and exaggerate the sort of qualities of that object in order to sell. Um, again, the principles are, are the same. Leave space around, so you've just got clear, clean edges. Also, just consider um, what, what, what what sort of workflow you're going to have. Just keep that in mind. Now, once you've got those um, objects in place, then you can start thinking about um, the, the objects maybe that um, are non-movable. So again, if you have large pieces of furniture and they're in a room set, um, clear the space around that. You know, take the stuff off the top of the surfaces, clear space around and all the clutter that may distract from the object. It, it, it is distracting, it doesn't look great, unless it tells a really good story. Some things do, uh, you can do little placements. I've seen a few on the internet this week which are actually quite smart photographs. Put them in sort of room sets, but it can look good. But keep it simple, keep it plain, plain and simple. Uh, so once you've sort of got your space, you put a background up, you're happy with the background, um, the next thing to start thinking about is the actual composition itself. Also the quality you want to um, pick up most of, of, of the object. So if it's the surface quality, the colour, um, textures, anything like that, consider what it is you want to photograph and what the client essentially wants to see and gain from seeing these photographs. Uh, this is something you're going to have to look at in the light that is going to be available to you, but we'll come to sort of lighting later on. This is going to be a slightly trickier subject because obviously you don't have the, the uh, studio lighting that comes along with people like me. Um, so we'll come to that later. We're looking also now, what we want to look at is your viewpoint. Do you want to photograph flat on? Do you want to tell more of a story by rotating to a three quarter? Will you do the full 360 rotation? Do you want to photograph a detail? Consider those, those factors, because obviously they take up different amounts of space and also is affected by the lighting you're going to be used. You can't necessarily do one lighting rig for all the shots of one object. You have to tweak and twiddle until you get exactly what you want. Um, what I've seen recently as well on quite a few uh, photographs on the internet is uh, people who've come in to take a photograph and they've either come too high, too low, or too near to an object. Now what that does um, is basically gives lens aberration, uh, so it gives an almost a curved effect or the pr perspective of the object is sort of shooting away or looming up on you or it's actually bending, so it's like a, a, a wide angle lens. So to get over this, drop away a bit further, and then you can crop in later to bring up the, the object itself. Certain software in, uh, will take out lens aberration. Thankfully, because I work professionally, I have software that recognises my camera. I shoot straight to the computer. All lens aberration, any distortion you get, or uh, the, the majority of it, is taken out by the software. I suspect you guys don't have that software. It's something called Capture One. Um, but it's essential for my workflow. Um, less essential for you, but be aware, you can correct any sort of distortion to a degree on the editing qualities or the editing menus on your camera or your own computers at home. You may have some software that will take them out. I don't know what you have, so I suspect if they've got it on a phone, they'll be able to do it on a um, camera as well. So what you want to have a little look at, as I said, is consider the shots you're going to take. Take plenty of shots. Take a lot of shots. You know, you've got it on there. You're shooting digitally. Take 
plenty of photographs. And I would consider taking quite a few um, close-ups, details. I think customers like seeing and people, clients will like to see details. I always shoot details to bring out some of the better qualities, some of the really small fine details like uh, maker's marks, always useful. Information is key, okay? So information, really, really good to get the whole uh, full package to you. So we've sort of talked about composition. Um, so we will move on, composition, to lighting. Now this is where it all becomes a little tricky for you. When I go into a, uh, a job, obviously I take quite a lot of lighting with me. And the reason being is completely controllable. Everything I photograph, I can control the lighting. Now, um, because I'm not available at the moment because of the lockdown, and uh, probably you're not available either for, for, for people to be on your premises, um, we can't bring that light in. So what is it that you have that you can photograph with? Lighting is key to photographing things because you need the light to obviously see the object and uh, therefore photograph. Um, what is available to you? Well, natural daylight. Natural daylight. At the moment, you may see that there's some light coming through from a window over here. That is actually lighting that quite nicely. I've, um, it's not doing a bad job, smaller objects. So if you have decent space with plenty of lighting, natural lighting, then gravitate towards that space. Use that space. If you have a conservatory, uh, if you have a studio with top lights or um, what you call them, V-Lux windows, fantastic. Great big picture windows, always very useful. Particularly on a day like today, which is a bit grey and overcast because what that acts like is a fantastic softbox. Great big diffused lighting coming in, superb lighting. Um, if I had a daylight studio, I would be a very happy man. You could rattle through quite a lot of work. Lovely, absolutely lovely. And it's a very, very soft light to work with. Um, the only thing with working with natural daylight is obviously you have time limitations. The sun and the light will move around during the day, so you may get sort of different qualities and different, um, di di different sort of shadow areas and light areas. So you have to work confidently, but you have to be um, aware of where the lights may change throughout the day. It's all a bit tricky because you can't control it. If it's a bright, bright sunny day, the problems that you will have with that is it will obviously throw in quite strong shadow areas and strong highlight areas. Um, so that's day, daylight for you, but work it, use it, daylight. Um, obviously you can have room lights, as I have here. Um, again, not really very controllable, but it will throw in an overall light. It will just light the area. If they're top lights, you know, that can be useful. Throw in, um, throw in a sort of decent amount of a covering light. And then thirdly, the last one, um, is whether or not you have sort of little angle poise or little basic studio lighting that you can use. Um, obviously there is some degree of control on that, um, very useful, but again slightly limited on what you can do. But you're going to have to work fairly hard to get the results you want, but take your time. It can be done. Um, consider each object. This is what I'm saying. Consider each ob object and the qualities you want to come out from that object. Use the lighting that you see around you. And as you move these objects around and move the lights around, just see how the image changes in front of you. Okay, so you can see if you're creating dark shadows or strong highlight areas, whether or not you want those um, is, is entirely down to you. I would just say avoid strong shadows and avoid hard highlights. Kind of difficult when you don't have the control, you don't have soft boxes. There are ways of doing it and I would 
um, I would try and basically soften down the lights that you have. Um, now there are ways of doing it, um, rather than using straight on lighting, you can bounce the light off the wall and that will soften it down. Uh, again, off the ceiling, bounce lights off the ceiling. So just shine the lights if you've got an angle point up against the ceiling or off a, a neutral background and that will soften the light, that will give you an overall soft light. Now, the other ways to do it is with uh, little bits and bobs like this. So bits of cart, larger pieces of cart, various sizes, they are always very good. You can always shine a light against that if the object's over there. So it just softens the light, disperses the light, softening the light. And if you can do things like that, and it's a fair amount of sort of cobbling about and sort of might be rather Heath Robinson effect, but you may well get the results. But I always try and avoid these very dark shadow areas and very strong highlights. It's slightly distracting and you lose the information in those areas of um, dark shadow and highlight, obviously. It's going to be a bit of a game, to be honest. Without the controllable lighting, it's gonna be a bit of a game. But just consider it um, a bit of a challenge Use what you've got around you, because that's all you've got, okay? Now, um, once you've sort of used these lights, um, it then comes to um, your editing of the objects. Um, so, once you get an, a, a photograph that you're reasonably happy with, um, you can then start putting together um, your cropping, your uh, colour balance, and all these are available on some of the basic software. Again, like I mentioned earlier on, uh, you should have some sort of basic software in your cameras that will um, put, put, uh, put, put, put the editing suites up for you. Um, I can't tell you exactly where they are because I obviously haven't a clue what cameras you're using or what software you're using. So that's kind of down to you, I'm afraid. But if you go, if you're photographing on the little smartphones, there are a whole menu of editing uh, facilities within the photo roll. If you go into your photo roll, click your edit, you have a whole load of little sliding scales, very simple to use, depending on what camera you've got or what, photo, uh, what telephone you've got. Um, and you can do your colour, your crop, saturation, even your exposure. And you can work it around and uh, hopefully produce half decent photographs. Now, I hope that this is something that you can all do. I hope this has been useful to you. Um, crack on, enjoy it, treat it as a challenge. Uh, take your time, most of all, and just observe what the light is doing. There is no control over the lights, or very little control, this is what I mentioned before. Um, any colour aberrations you get, because you obviously get um, different colour temperatures, I'm not going to bore on about colour temperatures, but it suddenly reminded me that I need to discuss that as well. Any colour temperature changes, and aberrations of colour. Again, within the editing suite, you can usually find um, the colour correction palette. Um, also, on your cameras, and also uh, on most cameras, I apologise, on most cameras you will find um, the colour balancing, or white balancing, they uh, refer to, on your set of menus. Again, look at your manual, see how you can set your white balance. I always will set my white balance from a grey card, one of these, a little QP card, which goes into the, um, into the shot before I photograph, and then I'll take a white balance off that. White balance is basically means that all the colours and all the temperatures of lights which you have will all come into line, and therefore you won't get a sort of strange orange cast from a top light when you mix it with that. Um, or vice versa if you've got or, or if you've got sort of neon lights they throw out one color and sodium lights throw out another so be aware of that color problem 
Okay, now I think I've sort of covered pretty much what I want to cover. I hope it's been of some use to you. Um, I, as I said, I've kept it pretty basic. Um, so there's not a lot more we can do. Crack on, enjoy. Uh, please give me a call if you feel you need some help directly from me. Um, all my details, Dominic Brown, photographer, are uh, all in the Lepada, um, uh website and uh, what was it, members book. I think I'm still in there at the back of that. Enjoy. I hope it's not too daunting for you. Um, good luck. And hopefully this uh, COVID-19 will be finished fairly soon and I will hope to see you uh, on site. Okay, thank you very much. Hope it's been of use. All the very best. Stay safe.